Hi, my name is Arthur Kieran Tan. I'm a composer horn player with the Addo Chamber Orchestra as well as an undergraduate composer horn player with the uh, NAFA, Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts in Singapore. It's actually a very good uh, resource for composers looking to write for the French horn. It's called a um, Douglas Hill Extended Techniques for the Horn. And it is, um, as far as I'm aware, it is the most comprehensive book around when it comes to dealing with extended techniques on the French horn. So there will be information on a whole range of extended techniques. He will mention the limitations of each technique, the, what it might sound like. And also, especially from, from a composer's point of view, how, how you might write for it, what you might expect to hear, that sort of thing. Okay, so in the typical orchestra, there's like four horns. Yes. Uh, number one, horns one, two, three, four. And traditionally, the, the division is always like it's one, always, uh, uh, one, three, one, two, three, four. two four. Or yeah. if there were six, it would be one, three, five, two, four, six, and so on and so forth. So the odd numbers are always, um, always a higher part and then followed by the even numbers. And um, I know nowadays a lot of uh, composers are writing uh, so-called straight, one, two, one, two, three, four. I would not, I would not consider this uh, universal. You can certainly do this if you like. It's absolutely, absolutely no trouble at all. Um, I think how, how, would you, how you would look at this is that the main reason that horns were uh, dovetailed into one, three, five, two, four, six, etc., is because on, on the on the instrument, it is quite difficult to find the right pitch, especially in in a isolated entry. We are talking about orchestral music specifically, so it was, it was always very easier to have the player seated seated next to you, um, playing a voice that was not the next lower voice, but rather two voices lower. So there there was a, a gap for you to be able to find where you fit in. So um, in the context of today. Um, you could certainly still write one, three, two, four. That's, and I would in fact recommend it if, particularly if you were writing a piece with, with strong tonality, a tonal piece, or uh, even a piece that just has a lot of emphasis on um, chords, especially this sort of thing. Um, if it is not such a tonal piece, you if you were the conductor, so. I'll be here, so, so you have first horn, second horn, yeah. and then, yes, the first horn is always on the left because the bell points this way, so the rest of the section can, can yeah. hear, okay. hear it. Okay. That the, makes sense. the only variation really is whether it's if they sit in a single line, one, two, three, four, or they sit in a square, which is one, two, three, four. So that, that, that is done to, when it comes to dealing with acoustics in a particular hall, balance with the rest of the orchestra, that sort of thing. Natural horn versus the valve horn. Mm. So natural horn, I mean, it, traditionally it was based on harmonic series. Yes. You could That's only right. play the harmonic series. Correct. Uh, and there were certain notes that were always off pitch, like yes. in the in the series. Uh, on the F horn, for example. So now, without any valves, I have a tube in that's pitched in F. So your F harmonic series. <laughs> Without the valves, these are the pitches that um, horn players were limited limited to. So on, on a valved instrument, I can sort of uh, replicate the idea of using crooks to change pitch. So F horn, second valve would be E horn, E flat horn, D horn, so on and so forth. So viewers not familiar with crooks, can you explain what those... Okay, um, without the valves, the natural horn is just the mouthpiece, the tube, and then you would have a slide somewhere in the middle that you can always pull out and uh, what a crook is is a tuning slide but you have many variations on how long the tuning slide is so for example if this was an F tuning slide I would have also a D tuning slide that was much longer so it would be something like this and maybe wind around a bit more and come in like that so um, so every time you have to bring many many of these yes. crooks 
many of Absolutely. these crooks to slide in. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, it was always a very dangerous. Um, there was a piece by Mozart where he actually made fun of the whole issue of, of changing crooks by intentionally writing for the wrong crook so the horn was <laughs> in a completely different key from the rest of the orchestra. He's, he's Mozart does this whole thing sometimes. So, yeah. so am I right to say that with the valve, the valve horn, right, you avoid those pitch problems with the like you know some of the harmonic some of the partials are very flat and now with the valve horn you absolutely. overcame absolutely. that absolutely um intonation in terms of intonation you absolutely don't have to worry about things for example like the seventh harmonic being very flat that sort of thing so for example on the f horn again this is the one the seventh harmonic which is very flat on for F1, that would be a written B flat. If I use the so called standard fingering for B flat, so that there's quite an obvious intonation difference. With, um, with a double horn in B flat and an F, and with three valves, the horn is completely chromatic all the way from bottom to top, so, and in tune as well. So, so let's talk about this double horn. Uh, yes. What what is that B flat and <coughs> F you, you are talking about? Um, when valves first came to the French horn, it was you had a choice of either horn in F or horn in B flat, and there was a lot of debate over which one was the more suitable instrument. But eventually, someone had the idea of adding a fourth valve operated by the thumb, and what this di did was to in a way, combine the B flat and the F instrument. So could, could you show it closer to yes. the ca uh, camera? Yes. So the parts that are shared between the both the B flat and the F horn would be just the lead pipe and the bell section, which goes here and ends here. In the middle of these two sections, the lead pipe and the bell section, it is um, you have two separate horns. You have a horn in F, which is which I have my F tuning slide over here. And you have a B flat horn, which you can't really see from here. You will see some of the B flat tubing I over see. here. So the valve, the thumb valve, j basically just changes between the B flat side and the F side. The B flat side, of course, being a shorter tube. Oh, where is the thumb valve? The thumb valve is here, for my thumb. Oh, I see. Right okay, yes. okay. Great. Alright. So now you have a very powerful two-in-one. It is yeah. yes, very much a two in one instrument. Nowadays, in fact, there's uh, even a triple horn where they. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I kid you not. Um, the F basso horn, the B flat alto horn, and an F alto horn, one octave above the F basso horn. The F alto horn is the same instrument you find on a descant horn, which I think uh, quite a lot of people should be familiar with. Descant horn being a B flat alto and F alto instrument. The triple horn basically combines the double horn and the descant horn. Many players p prefer the B flat horn trigger when they play higher notes or something. Like it's simply, simply because it's a lot more secure. For, exa for example, um, this is uh, written C five on the B flat horn. If I were to do that on F horn, there's a very big risk of clamming, mispitching, there are all sorts of terms to describe it. We, we don't like that happening. But on the F1, and there we are, I, I mispitched. So there are harmonics very close to the C that if you just aim slightly lower or slightly higher, you're going to miss the C. So they are very close together. On the F1, because the tube is much shorter, you, the harmonics in that particular place, the C5, they are further apart, so... so Wait, you mean roughly. B flat? B On flat the, is shorter. <coughs> the B flat horn is a shorter tube. Yeah, 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 yeah. So B flat so is more secure. The it's B more flat secure because your harmonics are higher. Yeah. It's a shorter tube. If I were to go even higher on the B flat horn, then I'll start running into the same problem. So. So there we are, we have that, that group of three notes, one whole tone apart. That's someone writing for middle school orchestra and someone writing um, for professional orchestra. Like, what is, yeah. 
middle school orchestra. I mean, so, like amateurs. So teenagers, amateurs. I would say um, G3 to G5 would be a very nice range, though. So from this G. This range. Um, for okay. professionals, you can extend it uh, both ways, upwards as well as downwards. So, professionals. All the way up to that uh, C6. Written C6 wow. and down, okay. downwards. I would stop here as a composer. You can get lower, but you have to be very careful writing beyond that. So, really beyond there, you if you have to write that low, really, it's just long notes and long sustained yeah. tones. I'll give it, it to someone else. I'll give it to a tuba or from <laughs> Yes. Pell tones, um, from scientific scientific point of view, is basically just the fundamental note. So, the horn is one of the few instruments where the lower limit of the instrument's range is not limited by the instrument, but rather by it the player because the tube is just so long you can actually the instrument can play a lot lower than most people can actually get so uh, yeah. that would be a pedal written C which is the fundamental on your open F1 I used a different fingering for the open F1 because the horn gets um, it gets very flat, low down. So th there is a certain pinch point where I switch to a fingering one semitone up, just to get it in tune. I see, I yes. see, wow. Um, it gets very flat down there. <clears throat> some, some, uh, some players will not, use, uh, uh, will not use a fingering one semitone up. They are able to bend the pitch. It's but below? No, uh, pedal tones are the fundamental. Are the fundamental, so, okay. Yes, so the next harmonic up from the pedal will be an octave. I second. see. How agile is the French horn leaping, leaping, leaping intervals? Leaping yeah. intervals actually more agile than most people would think. What when people say the horn is not an agile instrument, what what they're referring they're not wrong. What they're referring to is things like running notes. Those can be difficult because the horn, compared to other instruments, just doesn't respond very fast. But when it comes to leaping, it's not that sluggish. So. And that would be um, slurred. You can get even possibly even faster. Let's just try one octave. Oh, there we are. I was aiming for two octaves there. Yeah. Nice. It is nice. Not, not, so, not so sluggish. I'm always afraid of writing French horn below G3. Like, I feel that it's not very, it's not a good range. How, how, um, how agile or like, <clears throat> I mean, can if you play beautiful melodies? You can play melodies, I'm not sure if they'll be be beautiful. Like, <laughs> it, not, is, is, it, is it advisable to write below G3? Or, or should we just do down, like... Right down to, right down to C3, I would, I would go right down to C3. Possibly even lower, so. That is um Okay. You can be quite nice and nice and legato down there. I, I don't nice. think it's uh, You know, 
understand that you have to imagine the note before you play it, right? Yes, you have, so, to, you have to hear the note. So, you know, sometimes composers would write something like high notes. Uh, high notes very softly. Are you able to create that? Like, I mean, is there any issues about yes. entrance, uh, high notes and low notes? Uh, what do you recommend? Yeah. Very, very difficult. I would not, uh, I actually would not discourage composers from writing that sort of thing because that is very much a technical issue that the performer has, has to deal with is, is not an issue of the, the, of the instrument being incapable of doing that. But in general, it is very difficult. You have to hear the pitch before you come in, and the further away the pitch is from a comfortable range, obviously the more difficult it is. And of course, like you mentioned, uh, dynamics, for example, very high up and very soft is always very difficult because you need air to get up there. And when you play soft, you're you're sort of constricting a little bit to restrict the airflow to get a, a, a lower dynamic level. So, yes, very difficult. What, uh, pitch, what pitch do you recommend, roughly, written pitch, uh, in terms of comfort of high notes? Any? Anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Literally anywhere. Like, I, I, will, I, I don't piano, want to... Piano, um, yeah. Piano... That would be uh, written A5. That is still quite doable. Let's try the B flat above that. That's a bit risky. So, okay, okay I'll, I'll put it A5 for. for How soft piano. can you go uh, in the comfortable range? How soft can you play? In a comfortable range? Okay. Um. Nice. Um, it was a bit too ambitious there. What about low Quite, low notes? It gets yeah. uh, easier if you are talking about the soft playing. That that would be middle register. Let's go even lower. And it gets more difficult the lower you get. So. In the middle low register, if you want to write extremely soft things and you need a very soft entrance, that would be a nice place. Um, I don't like to put rigid limits on which, which see. note. But at is, least we have a good guy. <laughs> the, yeah, in general, you have to. It's, it's an issue of registers, not, not, not this note onwards and yeah. this note onwards. But yes, yeah, soft entrances, very soft entrances, middle to low register. Any, an any tips about crescendo, decrescendo, anything, uh, SFP, anything we need to take note of? Like, like you know, high, middle, low range, any high, difficulties? High, middle, low range. Like, crescendo, decrescendo. I don't, I don't think these are particular uh, concerns, except for when you have to decide how quietly to start and how loud you are going to be at the end. This is an this is issue of... Um, dynamic contour, you, you have to know what sort of dynamics the instrument is capable of. And on the horn, <coughs> I, would, I would describe the dynamic contour as a sort of, uh, from, from the pedal register to the low register, middle register, upper register, and altissimo register. So it's sort of pinched off at the ends. The extreme low and extreme high range, that's where you have a much smaller range of dynamics. So really, in terms of crescendos, oh, diminuendos, the only issue is how loud and how soft you want, you want to start and end. And that's about it. It's not a very big dynamic range down there. Yeah. And same issue on top. It's a high A onwards. Earlier when that we were talking a, about... A5. A5. Five, that's right. So. So, very small, uh, very small dynamic range over there. Um, Is it like a special fingering that you did or like no. how do you get altissimo? No. Oh, no, no, no. Al altissimo isn't a, a specific technique. I just used, uh, used that term to refer to 
the range above what most people consider the upper range. So early on, we were saying um, amateurs uh, and beginning players, you would, it would be safe to stop at uh, the high G. Beyond that, I'm um, I see. still an upper range, but I use the word autosomal to refer mostly actually to no, beyond the okay. high C that I, I mentioned as the limit for professional players. That is, uh, that is already a very high note. Yeah. But there have been uh, pieces written that ask for as high as the the E, a major third above that. That's oh my abs- god. Okay. That is absolutely crazy. Very, who who very wrote that? Do you know? Uh, it is a piece by uh, Schumann, the okay. concert stuk for four horns. It's a sort of a concerto, but for four horn players. And the first horn part is absolutely crazy. It goes right up to the high E. Is not not a lot of people can do that. Okay. In the professional circle, I think I think it would be, would be fair to expect uh, notes that high, but fair but cruel at the same time. <laughs> I think. Yeah.